So I'm going to talk uh, about coastal resilience. And let me make sure I can operate this thing. Uh, first of all, uh, let me tell you two quick things. Anything that I say is not the opinion of anyone who thinks that they employ me. I will speak towards some official positions, but uh, I really uh, prefer to speak candidly as opposed to like a government person. Uh, secondly, you need to know that I live in Charleston, South Carolina at five and a half feet. Mm -hmm. I look out my window and see egrets. Uh, and so these issues aren't just professional, they're personal. Uh, I like the joke sometimes that I hope to sell all my low-lying real estate before I succeed in my professional mission. <laughs> Although I'm not making great progress on that, uh, which probably a number of you can also identify with. Just because we understand risk doesn't mean that we're going to do anything about it, right? Joseph Califano talked about cigarettes. Uh, back in the late 60s, and it was the late 80s before I quit smoking those suckers. Anyway, so I'm going to talk not just about sea level rise, but a little bit. I'm going to use the whole issue of inundation, erosion, and sea level rise as kind of a mechanism for framing our discussion. And just today, the Metcalf fellows actually went out and learned how you uh, uh, monitor a beach profile and learned a lot about erosion, so I've got to throw in some stuff for them. Uh, and then in a place like Rhode Island, let me just simply say, if you hadn't already seen it yet, uh, coastal inundation, not to mention that pesky little capacity of the landscape. That's been a very important question. How many people can we put here? How much of this or that do we need there? But it turns out, like so many things in science, maybe the carrying capacity wasn't actually the spot on question to be asking in the first place. So let me tell you how I think about resilience. Resilience is like a tapestry, okay? And so it's a term, it's a term that engineers know, it's a term that ecologists know, but when we apply it to our communities where we live, think about a tapestry. You know, it's got threads that run both directions, the warp and the woof, and what can happen with any fabric is that it can take a fair amount of stress, twisting and turning. It can even take some abrasion. You can even put a hole in your blue jeans and they will still work. But the fact is, in order for that fabric to still be somewhat of a fabric, you have to have a few intact threads. There has to be some connectivity. So in your community, what am I talking about? I'm talking about the communities that have intact and robust civic organizations, social organizations, neighborhood organizations, infrastructure, good old concrete infrastructure, communities that have these sets of relationships before a disastrous event are going to be much likely to respond, recover more quickly, more vibrantly, than the communities that don't have these intact threads in their tapestry. So, so you can have stress on your ecosystems, and you can still make it. Or you could have stress on your infrastructure, your roads and your bridges, and you might still make it. It's not just an ecological construct. And, and the other thing about it is you can't wait for a major problem to assert itself. If you don't have these relationships in your community with the Chamber of Commerce, with the public agencies, with the community groups and the non-governmental organizations like Audubon or the Nature Conservancy or your local land trust, if you don't have those organizations that already have relationships, we've also seen that those communities have a difficult time recovering. So Rhode Island has some advantages because, well, first of all, look at you on a 3.30 on a Wednesday. There's a bunch of you out here. We were just talking earlier about what a fairly active community uh, exists all around here in the ocean state. That gives you a little leg up. Now, if we could just figure out how we could make our built infrastructure and our natural infrastructure a little more intact, a little more healthy, You've got the civic and the social institutions. You've got the Coastal Resources Management Center, uh, Coastal Resources Management Council. Council, right? Yeah, you got the regulatory agency that actually even listens to people at the university. Do you know how rare that is? 
I mean, in some parts of this country, they don't actually think people at the university know Dookie. Here you at least know that they can be useful. So that's a good thing. So why do I go into this? And I'm showing you this little structure. I'm showing you this bridge that's running through a wetland. Because connectivity, turns out carrying capacity is actually in some ways less important than connectivity. Both in the literal sense, can critters get through there, as well as in the metaphorical sense. Are you connected to your community? Do you have the kinds of groups? And are you able to take advantage of what Mother Nature can do for us? So this whole thing about resilience, as I said, it's been around for a long time. In fact, uh, a guy named Lao Tzu a few thousand years ago wrote this book called The Art of War. Uh, and what he's talking about is about being resilient. You neither hold the high ground nor you have the forces. You have to tack on as many fronts as possible. Well, that's also guerrilla warfare, but that could be being resilient too. But from an ecological perspective or a community perspective, this term is fairly recent, 30 years. But we've learned a whole lot in the last 30 years. And at the rate these, these uh, uh, extreme events are beginning to happen, we're learning a lot every year uh, what works and what doesn't work so well. But first of all, uh, get to know people before the stuff hits the fan. Uh, the people in the emergency management business say the disaster is not the time to pass out your business cards. So your rich tradition of public hearings in the Northeast, uh, your rich tradition of citizen engagement is very important. Uh, and citizen participation. So you need to understand your vulnerability, your risk, and your vulnerability. Your risk are what, what's going on around you. What kind of landscape do you live in? what's going on in terms of weather and other kinds of things. Vulnerability is what have you done about it. So two individuals or two communities could be equally risky, but one could actually take some steps. How we think about flood maps because of this event called storm surge. So you may be at a decent elevation, let's say 10 to 12 feet. Uh, but you get a really good storm that has a 20 to 25 foot surge. And what you need to be thinking about is what's going to happen the next time. So after Katrina, when we went into southern Mississippi and said, you should rebuild to the level of the storm surge plus one foot, we were cannon fodder. And yet when we went into New York City after Sandy and said, you should rebuild to the level of storm and you say, oh, that's OK. I got an elevator. Well, let me tell you one thing about electricity. It <laughs> hardly ever works when you really need it. <laughs> OK? So uh, same goes true for a lot of emergency generators, too. And for those of you who think you're golden because you've got an emergency generator, I would recommend that you elevate it. <laughs> there are a lot of hospitals in the Northeast which couldn't get to their generators after Sandy. So. Pay attention to that discussion about flood risk and flood maps, even if you don't have to buy flood insurance because you own your joint, because the flood's coming to you soon. And the thing about it is those flood maps are actually incredibly conservative. Uh, and not only that, the elevation on your plat map probably overstates your elevation. Because, uh, well, it depends on where you are, but in some parts of this country, the last time that data was collected was 30 or 40 years ago. Now, around here, it's been collected more recently because of some storm event that we had. So anyway, pay attention to this because this is going to really matter. For those of you who are on cliffs, maybe not so much. We'll talk a little bit about erosion in just a moment. Also, know that many states, both uh, progressive states as well as some of us down south, are actually beginning to elevate roadways and raise our bridges up higher. We even got that one figured out in South Louisiana uh, as well. So uh, this is going to be an important issue. I think that no matter who is the next president, we're going to have to spend a lot of money on infrastructure in this country. <laughs> or we will be a third-rate country. Uh, and so uh, my guess is it's probably going to be a Republican president. Uh, and, and probably the good news about that part, here's the good news about that part, is they actually tend to get more money out of Congress for infrastructure than the Democrats for some reason. I wonder what that is. Anyway, 
we have a great opportunity to think much smartly about our water plants, our sewage plants, our stormwater runoff, our roads, our bridges, even our piers and our ferry landing. Now, Lots of things are happening around the country. I would encourage you to check out the National Climate Assessment. It's online this time for the first time ever. Uh, and, and here's a, a little centerfold out of the chapter on coasts, uh, which I think that you uh, might find interesting. So let me just mention a few things that are going on in your neighborhood. Uh, up in Portland, Maine, uh, they're actually beginning to retrofit their wastewater infrastructure. They're trying to elevate uh, most of it and relocate some of that which they can't uh, elevate. Uh, up in New Hampshire with uh, all 15 miles of their coast, uh, they've been really working on this issue as well at the local government level, so they're trying to figure out what to do about stormwater. That's a real big problem for them. And I assume you all know that Boston's been at this for a while. First there was the big dig and now there's the big stormwater project. Uh, and they're trying to do some things there. And then, of course, in Rhode Island, uh, they would love for more things to happen down here uh, and in Connecticut as well. Uh, Delaware and Maryland have begun projects not only to look at things like uh, water treatment and stormwater, uh, but both of those states are actually trying to figure out how they put together programs to buy up, buy out certain pieces of property. Uh, for instance, in Maryland, they now, there's a bunch of little islands out in the middle of Chesapeake Bay where even fewer people live there than live on Block Island. Uh, and they're trying to, and those islands are like at five feet elevation. They're trying to get those people to leave those islands, uh, which is going to be a bit of a challenge. And then this week right now, there's a big to-do uh, down in Hampton Roads, Norfolk, Virginia. They have a, the world's largest Navy base is, is right there. And for some reason, the Navy really takes this matter very seriously. So they've already spent a billion dollars on, on seawall gates, big, huge metal barricades. And they're looking for another $5 billion to extend their seawall. They're also looking to elevate their sewage and their stormwater uh, because there are whole communities in the old part of Norfolk where people can't sell their houses. Well except maybe in dry season, uh, because uh, for some reason, lots of people don't want to take a boat to get to their house. I don't understand what that's about. But So they're trying to figure out how the Navy can spend a lot of money, how the municipal government can spend a lot of money, how the regional government can spend a lot of money. And this is in Virginia, where they stripped out all the language about climate change out of the legislation and word process, substituted recurrent flooding for sea level rise. Now, of course, that's not quite as dumb as North Carolina, where they spent $10 million to study sea level rise and its impact on the Outer Banks. Uh, and then a group of uh, concerned developers formed a little group, and they tried to outlaw sea level rise in the state legislature. And they would have succeeded, except for the fact that my homie, Stephen Colbert, made fun of them on the national comedy shows. So they kind of backed off from that a little. Uh, but it's still a real problem in North Carolina. And they got some really bright universities there that they're not paying attention to. Now, in my state of South Carolina, I'm just going to skip South Carolina <laughs> all together. And let's jump on down to Florida, where they have a governor who doesn't even believe in government. Um, <laughs> but... The five counties southernmost in Florida actually think stuff is beginning to happen. They formed the South Florida Climate Compact. Now, of course, Florida, you know, it's pretty obvious. You look out your door, the water's right there. You, you can't, you know, avoid it very easily. I mean, they are toast. I mean, there's just this little bitty hump that runs through Orlando, and you can't stick everybody in Florida on that little bitty hump, okay? But here's the problem. In this country, We've never really relocated large populations. We've only relocated small populations after events like West Valley, New York, or Greenberg, Kansas, or, or that town in Iowa on the other Red River that runs the wrong way. I'm from Texas. The, the Red River that runs the right way is in Texas, and then they have one up there in the northern Mississippi that actually runs north. But we've only relocated small communities. We've never contemplated what to do about whole communities, towns, you know, someplace right near here. 
Now, we're only probably talking about 60 million people in the U.S. who are at risk from extreme flooding in the next couple of decades. And maybe only 600 million people worldwide in the next few decades. Can you imagine the thought about that? 60 million people? What do we do with 60 million people in this country? You know, we put more people, they've got more expensive property, they're paying more taxes, they're paying more flood insurance. And, and the first instinct of people after that storm kicks their ass is they just want to get their act back together. It's a natural and human instinct, unless you're really scared and then you want somebody to buy you out so you can go someplace safe like I don't know where, maybe South Dakota. But anyway, my point is that communities, actually localities, are the places where action is happening all around this country. Mayors are at the forefront of thinking about new ways of planning for our communities and what to do about these kinds of events. And there are some governors as well, but I will admit that most of the governors tend to be in the Northeast or on the West Coast. Uh, and then in my part of the world, from Texas to Virginia, uh, well, we're kind of like that ostrich, right? So that's why I talk about these events a lot. But you can go and get information about what different communities are doing. In fact, the Georgetown University Climate Center just published a little guide to state and local adaptation efforts, and it's online as well, uh, that I would heartily recommend to you. Uh, but there are very interesting things that are going on from South Louisiana to the North Shore of Alaska, uh, as well as in larger communities.